what does this airplane, this airplane, and even this airplane all have in common? We're going to tell you on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashad. What these three diverse aircraft have in common is that the markings are all governed by Mashat's Law of Aircraft Markings. This states that within one year from delivery, no two airplanes of similar type will be painted exactly the same. This applies for military and commercial aircraft. The corollary states that over the life of an airplane, the only consistency in its color scheme will be its inconsistency. Now, here's how it works. This is a Lockheed F-94 Starfire. It's an interceptor used at the early uh, years of the Cold War. Wait a minute. I have a better photo of the F-94. There we go. That's better. It was an interesting airplane. But let's talk about the markings. So uh, on an F-94, you have a black radome, a red speed stripe, uh, U.S. Air Force titles, silver tip tanks. You, no, wait a minute. You have a tan radome. Uh, red uh, speed stripe, Lockheed logo, red tip tanks, or now you have all three silver. What's going on? Well, believe it or not, these three airplanes are all from the same unit. The 354th Fighter Interceptor Squadron stationed at Oxnard Air Force Base, California in 1955. Perfect example of Mashat's Law. So now we're going to bring you 10 examples of this phenomenon and show you how it works on military and commercial airplanes. And we'll start with uh, item number one, billboards and meatballs. What do these words mean? Well, the billboard titles are the large airline names you see uh, plastered on the sides of the airliners today for high visibility. Uh, a meatball is a round logo, such as the Pan Am logo on the tail of this 747. But here we see a Pan Am 74 Series 100 on a hazy day at New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport. Kind of hard to read the uh, name of the airline if you didn't know it was Pan Am. The solution was the billboard. And this scheme came about uh, with the advent of the Airbus being added to uh, Pan Am's fleet in the uh, 1980s. And it's very identifiable. It, uh, the name pops right off the side of the airplane. But the specifications called for the uh, lower right-hand corner of the leading letter, the M in this case on the right-hand side, uh, to be located uh, exactly 36 inches above the floor line and 36 inches aft of the trailing edge of the R1 door. So that would be the way all the airplanes would be expected to be painted if it's by spec, right? Well, <laughs> here's one that's 24 inches off the floor line with the tip of the M touching the trailing edge of the door. And this photo was taken in 1972 at JFK, uh, looking down from a DC-8 taking off. Uh, but there you see the Pan Am Worldport Terminal. And in the 1980s, I had a project for Pan Am, and I was back there and saw at this terminal four different 747s. And no two billboard markings were in the exact same spot on any of those airplanes. Mashat's Law. All right, here's a meatball on a Continental DC-10. So is it black against a gold tail fin? Or would that be red against a gold tail fin? Or would it be red and white against a gold tail fin? Perfect example, all different. Number two, engine nacelles. What we see here is an American Airlines Boeing 720 powered by Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojets. These were called straight pipe engines based on the uh, noise suppressors that you see there. And the engine markings uh, were, you know, carried the color of the fuselage out on the uh, out onto the wing and, and gave the airplane a little more visual presence. Now here we see an American 707 Astrojet with the Pratt & Whitney JT-3D turbofans. Uh, the idea for the nacelle markings were carried over, actually, from the piston era, seen on this American DC-7B. Now, here we have an Electra that looks like American's markings, but uh, that's actually Eastern. America's nacelles look like this. So, again, a lot of variety. Number three, this is fun, operational modifications. Here we see a Delta Airlines Convair 880, one of the most beautiful early generation jet airliners ever built. 
just elegant, exquisite markings. And this airplane was referred to uh, by Delta as the aristocrat of the jets. It was the Golden Crown 880. Well, the idea is that the entire airplane would be painted white. And that really looked cool, but operationally, there were some issues with the uh, uh, mud and debris kicked up from the landing gear and uh, engine thrust uh, uh, getting the bottom of the wing stained and so on. So the first solution was to uh, leave the uh, aft fuselage underside bare metal. And in this photo, you can actually see the uh, stains from the reverse thrusters uh, on the pylon. Uh, during uh, uh, landing, the, the exhaust would be kicked up under the wing, and that would uh, create some problems. So they left the entire lower fuselage bare metal, and they changed the pylons to bare metal as well, and that solved that problem. In uh, the mid-1960s, with the advent of Delta's DC-9, they changed the uh, color scheme to what they call the widget. Uh, look, and this is applied to the 880, which served Delta up until about 1970. And here you see the entire lower uh, portions of the airplane are left bare metal, except for the very forward part of the nacelles. Still a good looking airplane. Number four, is the logo correct? You're not going to believe this. This is the Bell X2 seen at the Bell plant near Niagara Falls, New York. This was the first airplane to fly Mach 3, a very futuristic machine in the 1950s. And here we see uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pete Everest, Chief X-2 Project Pilot at Edwards, and the Bell X-2 logo. This is the iconic, uh, what was called the Drop Shadow logo for the X-2. This is uh, Ship 2. Uh, the first of the X-2s had this logo, where the Drop Shadow is separated from the red letters. Uh, that's Pete Everest in the cockpit, Bell X-2 Program Engineer Stan Smith in the center, and Bell Test Pilot Skip Ziegler at right. Now, here we have actors Bill Holden and uh, Lloyd Nolan, uh, who played uh, characters in the movie Toward the Unknown, the story of the X-2 at Edwards in the mid-1950s, with yet another logo. Here's Captain Ivan Kinchlow, who flew the X-2 to 126,000 feet in 1956. And now we can see things are changing. The uh, heat that's uh, created at that speed blistered the paint. And the airplane was repainted numerous times each time with a new logo. So guess what? There were a total of seven Bell X-2 logos used on the airplane. All right. I saw it in an aviation museum, so it has to be correct, right? Mm, maybe not. Here's the Douglas X-3, shown rolling out of the Santa Monica plant in 1951. Very exotic-looking airplane, but it never performed as it was uh, intended, because it never had the engines it was designed for. That's a whole nother video. But here it is in the Douglas markings, a, a small Douglas flight test logo on the tail. That's a, a photo calibration grid painted uh, on the air intake there for photo chase. Now compare this scheme to the uh, U.S. Air Force scheme put on the X-3. And you see some subtle variations there, Air Force title on the tail. Here it is in the NACA markings. And the airplane, there was only one X-3 built, I should have mentioned that, and uh, it wound up in the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. And I had occasion to visit there on a project, and I saw the airplane and noticed that there were some uh, large metal humps on the top of the wing, right near the wing root. Uh, there's a better view. It looked like a fairing of some sort. And I don't ever remember seeing something like that in the photos of the airplane at Edwards. There's the wing. And there's looking down, there's, there's no hump there. So I asked a docent at the museum, and he told me the following story. You're not going to believe it. When the X-3 was first delivered to the museum in the uh, uh, mid-1950s, after it was done with its flight test program, they didn't have any space to store it. The museum hadn't been built yet. And so uh, it was out in a kind of a scrapyard, and they cut the wings off the airplane to save space. When the museum opened, uh, the wings were put back on, but the uh, scar from the hacksaws were so visible that they just uh, couldn't leave it like that, so they covered it with a fairing. Now, can you imagine a model builder or an artist going there to research the jet, looking at that and putting it in his painting or on the model? 
You got to be careful in a museum. Number six, trademark antenna or not? Special shout out to uh, viewer Dragonfly for asking the question, and I included in this uh, presentation. Uh, here we see the identifying features of the 707, and that's a trademark high frequency radio antenna uh, probe atop the vertical fin. It was really a very uh, identifiable feature of the 707 at the beginning of the commercial jet age. Well, when the 720 made its debut a year or two later, uh, it had it was a shorter fuselage, medium range version of the 707. It had a taller vertical fin and there was no probe. It was an easy way to tell the difference. So here's TWA's first 707 rolling out at Renton. It has the probe on the tail. And when they went to the fan jet version, there was no, it was a 720 tail fin. It was no probe. This is why aviation historians have gray hair. You can tell it's a 707 because there's two emergency uh, overwing exits you can see there. Well, here's where it gets interesting. This is TWA's first 720. And look at the tail. It's got a probe. Go figure. Number seven, factory color schemes. This is the Convair B-58 Hustler, first flew in 1956, the world's first Mach 2 jet bomber. And this is the iconic uh, first flight photo uh, issued by Convair. Um, I, did, I made a little uh, discovery in working on this photo for the presentation. Uh, Convair actually tilted it up 10 degrees uh, to make it look even more dramatic. And I got to give it to the PR guys. I would have done the same exact thing. But here's an early test airplane in the uh, distinctive red and white factory color scheme. You notice there's a black radome. Here's the very same airplane without the black radome. So again, Mashat's law. This is the large scale monogram kit with yet another factory color scheme. And here's the airplane at Edwards undergoing flight test with the Edwards Chevron and shield on the tail. But the operational aircraft all had the uh, SAC emblem on the left and the unit uh, emblem on the right and additional markings as you see here. Number eight. If you're an airliner enthusiast, you probably know this date. On the dark and stormy night of Wednesday, November 24th, 1971, a mysterious man using the name of a daring, fictitious comic book character hijacked Northwest Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727-100 flying from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. He demanded $200,000 in cash and four parachutes in exchange for allowing all 36 passengers to exit the aircraft before it was allegedly to be flown to Mexico. This historic photo shows the actual jet sequestered on a distant ramp at Seattle Tacoma Airport where it sat for nearly five hours, surrounded by law enforcement vehicles and personnel while it was being refueled. The man used the name Dan Cooper to purchase his ticket for $20 a name that became D.B. Cooper in the media. The last time he was ever seen alive was 8 p.m. that evening, alone in the darkened rear cabin of the 727, preparing to bail out of the jetliner with a canvas bag filled with $10,020 bills. Now, this is the delivery scheme for a Northwest 727 in 1964. This is the jumbo jet scheme used on the airline's Boeing 747 and McDonnell Douglas DC-10 wide bodies in the early 1970s. The aircraft hijacked by D.B. Cooper that night wore a unique hybrid color scheme, combining elements of both. And here we can see the drawing that I was working on. I was going to do a painting of the bailout. Uh, and this was going to be produced as a lithograph and sold uh, commercially to airliner enthusiasts. But there was just, as Colombo would say, there was just one thing. Here are the delivery uh, color scheme markings. And this is what the uh, audience would have expected. This is what all the airliner guys were thinking the airplane looked like. In actuality, it looked like this. And here was my, I'm sorry, the tethered money bag you see there. Uh, that's not a drag chute. That was the canvas bag uh, filled with the money that he, that uh, Cooper tied to his uh, belt. And this acted as uh, like the survival pack in a military 
a bailout where you have warning that you're going to hit the ground and know to go into the PLF or parachute landing fall. So there's my painting. Now, I had to take some artistic license. Uh, it was pitch black that night, but I wanted to show the moment that he left the jet by the rear stairs. And this was uh, right around the Oregon-Washington border, and he was never seen again. Number nine, U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. Here's an array of different aircraft. They're all wearing the uh, unique and distinctive red and white chase plane markings used at Edwards in the 80s and 90s. Here's the F-4 in that uh, scheme, kind of a dramatic shot, but very distinctive and uh, really quite attractive. There's just one thing. There were some variations, even on the same airplane. Here we have an F-16. Take a look at the stabilator. It's got a white leading and trailing edge and uh, a white uh, tip. And so if you're building a model or making a painting, you want to make sure it's accurate. But a year later, this airplane went through the paint shop and uh, wound up with a stabilator that had a red-orange red trailing edge. So again, you got to be careful. You got to do your research. And finally, a designation change on the same airplane. In 2018, I had the privilege of designing a unique and historically significant color scheme for the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School's one-of-a-kind Lockheed Martin Calspan NF-16D. In June 2021, the NF-16D was redesignated as our nation's newest X-plane, the X-62A Vista. Vista stands for a Variable In-Flight Simulation Test Aircraft, an airplane that is currently changing the face of air power. Developed by the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in collaboration with Calspan Aerospace, Vista is fitted with software that allows it to fly with the performance characteristics of other jet aircraft. As announced by the Air Force on February 13, 2023, the X-62A was flown by artificial intelligence for more than 17 hours representing the first time that AI was engaged on a tactical aircraft. Now, here's the original TPS tail flash as I designed it. And here's the new designation incorporated very nicely into that design. For a kid who grew up in the 1950s mesmerized by the X-planes flying at Edwards Air Force Base, this project not only defined Machat's law at its best, but was indeed a dream come true. So there you have it, a look at 10 examples of Machat's Law for aircraft markings and configurations. I'd like to thank the special folks that uh, supply the photos and support that allow me to bring these presentations to you. And thank you so much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. Appreciate your watching the channel. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board. And please do hit the like button on the way out. It helps us with YouTube. As always, until next time, take care.